Hello, uh, thanks for uh, coming uh, to this talk. Hopefully, uh, we can uh, have a little bit of uh, discussion either at this talk or later on on, on, on the mailing list. But uh, the this talk is uh, structured in four parts. We will talk uh, a little bit more background what machine learning is, or at least uh, what it is in the concept of this talk. Uh, then a little bit about threats and uh, a little bit about opportunities. And uh, in a nutshell, uh, th there is th this talk is not like the, the sky is falling over us or anything. It's uh, that we, we not doing anything is really a, an option. Uh, the, the threats uh, are more maybe five to ten years from now, really. Uh, and uh, some of the threats can be addressed uh, outside of Debian. But uh, I, I, I truly believe that the opportunities uh, are, are more at the distro level. And that's also uh, something that you are uh, welcome to, to disagree. So what is machine learning? Uh, machine learning has uh, this issue that uh, people take it a little bit uh, uh, a little religious. It's like the computer learns stuff. In reality, it's just uh, some statistical modeling with a, a focus on predictive uh, uses of the statistical model. And uh, the most common case is uh, there is a phase that is called the training phase, or you can also call it estimation. And for the way we normally work, we can call it more like a compilation phase. Uh, where we take as input vectors of features, including some target feature, and that's what we could call like the, the feature data, and the output is a train model. In general, this thing is fairly large, and the train model, you can think of it as a, as a statistical summary of uh, the, the input data. And then you have an execution or prediction or uh, interpretation phase, where the input is the vector of features without the target feature and the train model, and the output is a predicted target feature. So for an example uh, that I'm familiar with, and it's something I may want to package in some moment as part of the Debian Science uh, linguistics track, is the Stanford Syntactic Parser. It's uh, written in Java, it's a GPL license, it's a fairly mature code, it's a surprisingly, surprisingly well-written code for coming from natural language processing. It's a probabilistic concept-free grammar parser, and the train model is, uh, takes two megabytes. The source data is the Penn Tree Bank that is, uh, was assembled at the University of Pennsylvania. It's several years of Wall Street Journal annotated with syntactic data. Uh, it takes a whole CD-ROM, so you go from 600 meg to two meg, yes. And this one is only available under a, a closed license and uh, you cannot distribute it, etc. And this is how the output of the parser looks like. We take a completely random sentence, not coming from the Debian website at any point in time. Like an operating system is a set of basic programs and utilities that uh, make your computer run. And here you have a sentence, and this is uh, the subject, and the object, and etc. So clearly, I mean, in general, a, a syntactic parser is just a part of a larger system, like for example, the summarization and other activities, but this is a type of software we may want to uh, distribute uh, in Debian. And the issue is that these models, some of these models are actually easy to understand and, and, and modify by hand. For example, in uh, an earlier work uh, I had, uh, we were doing word sense disambiguation, and we were using an algorithm called C45 rules that produce this type of nice looking rules. So for example, you say, if the word after the, 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 the name uh, includes encodes, and it doesn't include encodes before, then most likely it's a gene, because gene encodes stuff. Yes, while uh, proteins are encoded and, and things like that. So these type of rules are rules that you can think this could be a preferred uh, uh, form of mo for modification because you can understand them and change them. On the other hand, uh, most models are uh, ununderstandable models, which people told me you should say in incompre incomprehensible, yeah, that uh, are not really intended to be understood or modified by hands. And you have things like uh, neural networks, although are, are not that popular these days, support vector machines, markup models, conditional random fields. These are large collections of floating point numbers. They are very, very opaque. They, 
there is no real uh, intention behind them to be uh, dealt with by hand. So you most probably are familiar with neural networks uh, because they are still uh, quite uh, taught. You have some, uh, the input features come here and you have these different ways that in this diagram are represented by different thickness on the lines. All these numbers get multiplied by these weights and a function gets applied in each node and fit forward until you get uh, to the different uh, output class. Uh, so in total, if you have n nodes here, m nodes there, and l nodes there, you will end up having something like n times m plus m times l floating point weights. This makes a huge, huge space of possible uh, weights uh, representations. So just to, to represent the, the, the space for one bit neural network, it looks like this, and if you go to neural networks actually do something interesting, you get an n-dimensional object that I guess uh, Edgar will be the only person who can visualize that. And uh, support vector machines are even worse because the concept is to find a hyperplane that divides positive from negative training data. But uh, most uh, SVMs use this kernel trip, uh, trick where they map features into a higher dimensional space with the idea that if the mapping is smart enough, then you can find an easy separation hyperplane. Uh, these are fairly de technical stuff, but the main point is that you're not supposed really to look at the support vector machine and say, hey, I could modify this hyperplane in uh, 10,000 dimensions a little bit and get a better model. What you do is you retrain from the source data. Uh, to make things even a little more mooded, feature vectors in general are not unlike generating YAC or, or Bison C files. Yes, you, you're, you have this difference between train data, that is the transcribed speech, for example, and the feature data that are these little wave segments with associated transcriptions, or, for example, if you have a, a trainable spell corrector, you can, your training data is the Wikipedia history, and your feature data are the edits that modify a word with less than two characters. Th this stuff is fairly detailed, even if we just uh, distribute the, the feature data will be way ahead of what is happening right now. Okay, so where are the threats for, for, for uh, I, I distinguish between threats to freedom and threats to practicality. The main threat to freedom is obsolescence, yes. Uh, slowly the users are, are going to get accustomed to applications that rely on these large training sets. And this is not unlike uh, the type of uh, threats being uh, addressed by uh, the Freedom Box Foundation for uh, cloud services. Yes, so for applications such as uh, optical uh, character recognition, you know, like book, book scanning, speech recognition, that will be the detection, computer vision, automatically tag your friends on photos, uh, and question answering, uh, Siri and, 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 and Watson, yes. If people uh, start expecting this type of things to be things that they want to run on their devices, uh, well, then uh, we are going to lag ahead, uh, lag behind quite a bit. And overall, what we see here is that we have a diminishing value behind source code. Yes, and there is more value on data. Uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google+, Flickr, and that's something from uh, Bidel's talk this morning that he was saying, well, when you are using these platforms, you are giving away your, your private, uh, private information. Well, moreover, you are actually empowering these uh, players to build better models. So it's not only that uh, you are hurting yourself by disclosing your private information, you're also hurting the, the free software uh, cost by enabling them to build better tools that we won't be able to compete without having access to all that data. And uh, I don't know if you're aware, but there exist data vendors. You can go to this uh, InfoChimps marketplace and buy a nice chunk of uh, 100,000 uh, linking uh, profiles and things like that. They are fairly expensive, but uh, you are being sold right now. And uh, again, even if we had the money to buy these, the mo we can distribute the models as free software, but we won't be able to distribute the data. And uh, in a less uh, evil, so to speak, the, the Pentry Bank data is uh, being released by the Linguistic Data Consortium. That is a nonprofit 
uh, sharing the, the maintenance of this data. But uh, still, most of the data distributed by the LDC is proprietary because the newspaper articles belong to the Wall Street Journal. So even if you want to make the annotations for free, people need to get the, the newspaper articles. And to me, these uh, issues of uh, machine learning are yet another clever GPL circumvention trick. Yes, in the last uh, decade, we have seen plenty of uh, smart ways to navigate around the, the GPL. And uh, in, some ca in this case, then you have the vendor releasing the source code of what at the end of the day ends up being just an interpreter. Yes and keeping the data behind train models completely closed. So the fundamental freedoms of being able to study, modify, and, and adapt to your own uses are being held back from the users. And to me, the, 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 uh, the exact uh, metaphor and uh, analogy here are uh, binary firmware blobs, yes? You, because uh, in general, machine learning models have been treated so far in Debian more as video game assets. But in reality, uh, you have their decision information that is used for uh, coding. Now, if we were to go down the rabbit hole and consider the data and the building of the model as part of something we want to uh, consider completely part of Debian as programs, then we have the issue that this is not a similar to anything else we are doing in Debian at this time. Training machine learning models takes a whole different type of build machine. It's not uh, unheard of to use 64 gig machines for three days. Yes, so redoing this work, uh, well, we really will need to have a very, very good reason to do it. And it most likely we'll uh, need to have different type of sponsors for that. And even worse, it becomes when you are to start talking about distributing this training data. Because, as I was mentioning, well, you have some data, for example, derived from Wikipedia, and you may end up having to host that type of uh, large data files. So this, data ha this issue has been discussed already a few years back in uh, 2009. There was a post from uh, the Mr. Matthew Blondell, uh, to the Debian legal, uh, legal mailing list. And uh, what he asked was, the first one was whether Debian can ship models in main without distributing the original data. And the answer there uh, provided was yes, because the model is considered the preferred form uh, for modification. The objective of this talk is to say, well, this answer is something we may want to revisit moving forward, yes, because the reasoning there was that this is the same thing as having two-dimensional render images uh, rendered from a 3D model in games that are not being distributed, uh, the 3D model. To me, that's different because the, the two-dimensional images uh, don't contain any logic about the program. And the second question was a little off topic for Debian. It was about fingerprinting of the data. And uh, there were some answers uh, related to that. One of the interesting things about this is that it spam a, a massive flame war. And uh, I, uh, that, in a sense, uh, informed me about the dangers of giving this talk. So I hope we have a fire extinguisher nearby. <laughs> but uh, there was a quote, for example, that I want to I said, free data is important for the very f same reasons that free programs are. And going back to the fundamental freedoms of modifying and studying and adapting, uh, I, I personally agree very much so with that quote. But on the other hand, it is a slippery slope. As uh, another quote says, say, well, if you won't ship models because you don't have access to the source data, then you shouldn't sh ship pictures because they are initially photographed of an object, and the preferred form of modification is the original object. <laughs> yes, if you want to see it. You... And uh, of course, th th this was just uh, flaming, but uh, it is indeed the case, particularly when you go back to what I was saying of the training data and the feature vectors, etc. I did a little bit of a search within uh, 
the Debian archive and I didn't found anything that I would really put my finger on it. And this uh, chemistry kit seems to have some data there, but I cannot really, I don't know, not uh, really familiar. I know for sure OpenCV has a face uh, that uh, it can say in this photo there is this square where there is a face, and that's been trained from a library of, of, of uh, photos, but I couldn't really find where in our distribution of OpenCV that data is. And I know the UEMA sandbox has some trained models, but uh, I'm not familiar whether we are really distributing the sandbox at this time. So truly, I mean, this is not an issue we have right now. There is a very nice uh, dictation software that I'm going to talk uh, in a bit that is now being distributed with GPL data. And well, in that case, we will, if we want a packet, we have to do something about that uh, source audio files. On the other hand, something this, uh, this makes huge opportunities for Debian. In my perspective, the main challenge for Debian is to change users into contributors. Yes, how can we make uh, people get more engaged with the project? And uh, in a sense, we can try to get contributors that will push new training data. When they use a software and the software uh, underperforms, they can help make the software better by sending uh, data files. So I think that could uh, mimic the su success case of, of the many translation teams we have, for example. And data contributors can, uh, so in some sense, send data patches that uh, will fix a bug by improving the model. This is very tricky because uh, the statistical models tend to be asymptotic. So uh, every time you retrain them, the, the model will improve, but uh, in some cases it will uh, decrease in others. But still, uh, this is a very good way to bring people into the project and feel they have more ownership on uh, the, the software they use. And moreover, something that I would like to see too is more inter-distro collaboration. There is a lot of uh, uh, were going on between uh, Debian and its derivatives, particularly Ubuntu, but uh, there will be also interesting to see a collaboration with RPM-based distributions. And one of the things that is very nice about training data is that sharing data is usually much easier than sharing code, because the format of the data seldom changes. And in a sense, that's what leads to object orientation. You, you encapsulate data because uh, data is more stable. For example, all syntactic parsers in the last 15 years or so have all been trained on exactly the same pen tree bank data set. So th there are certain uh, um, data sets that are fairly stable. And uh, sharing annotation work uh, should be uh, easier, yes, than, than uh, sharing uh, source code patches. Now, here are some, some questions. How can we acquire this data? Do we want to build something like a free software uh, volunteer-driven mechanical torque-like tool? I'll, I'll uh, explain on the next slide what the mechanical torque, if you've never heard of it. The, there are already existing uh, initiatives like LibriVox, where volunteers read uh, books aloud for, from the project Gutenberg. And the second is, how can we assure the data and its derived model is kept free? Yes, we, we may need something similar to the Creative Commons uh, soup of licenses. And it's, of course, the question whether just applying GPL to the data will be enough. Uh, these questions of, uh, completely exceed me. I don't have the feeling that GPL is enough, but uh, that's being used by other projects. Okay, so the mechanical torque is part of the Amazon Web Services offering. It's a commercial uh, proprietary platform where you write a task that is easy to do by humans, like there is a person in this picture, but it's difficult for computers. Uh, you have paid workers that are called uh, in the uh, slang of, 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 of mechanical torque, turkers, and do this task for really, 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 completely unacceptable tiny wages. 
And of course, this poses uh, plenty of ethical issues. Uh, first thing is whether this is just pure exploitation of, of uh, the talkers. And even more interesting is, well, maybe these people are being paid to help develop tools, uh, develop systems that go against their own moral values, but they just don't know what they are doing because the tasks are so precise and small. The, this website, uh, BoxForge, I uh, found out about it very, very recently, and uh, it contains a large number of GPL transcribed sam samples. And the objective is to put together state-of-the-art dictation systems using free software. And the intention is that the acoustic models that are derived from these uh, sound samples have to remain free. And interestingly, the, only, the, the state of the art tool to train the acoustic model is called HTK, and it's proprietary. There is still no uh, free software equivalent for it. But uh, they have a, so basically this will be the compiler. There is no free compiler. But there is a, a speech recognition engine called Julius that is free software. And you can download a, a demo they have. And, but if we want to package BoxForge models, we also have to distribute all their source data, all these uh, sound files. We'll have to build these models at build time. Uh, that will be difficult because HTK, even though it's freely available, you have to sign a license to obtain it. These are not questions that haven't been answered in, in, in Debian before, but uh, it might be the case for this type of cases. We don't need to distribute the source data ourselves. Just be sure that they are available on their site. OK, so the first thing is uh, don't take it personal with me. i not changing anything as things are right now. It should be OK for, for the time being. Uh, I still uh, think it would be nice if we can uh, find other people who are interested in this problem that we were willing to talk with maybe the software uh, law center about any licensing or how to proceed about trying to make some inter-distro projects. And uh, overall, I still think it would be good if we can revisit our current uh, policy and, and transition for, away from considering trained models as the preferable form for modification. So in a sense, model, packages that contain these models that we don't have access to the data should be just uh, put in contrive because well, they are freely available, but the users uh, cannot make use of them without access to this uh, uh, proprietary uh, resource. And we may want to differentiate between the Debian archive hosting all the code and assets versus all the source data. That's a little more difficult. Debian really likes the fact of being completely self-contained at the archive level. Uh, still, there are other organizations like archive.org that specialize themselves in hosting large amount of, uh, of, of uh, data. And finally, I don't know if you, the, the first, uh, uh, the CLANG uh, 2.9 and 3.0 recompilation of the whole Debian archive that was undertaken uh, recently was done on a European resource called GRID 5000. So there are large uh, clouds available for uh, research use through the world that we may be able to get time on to train models if uh, we go for them uh, as, uh, as an organization. But uh, what do you guys think? Um, I, I, I had a kind of a, of a comment and doubt about the GPL and these things. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that there's a problem that's common to metaprogramming. The model is not being coded by people. The model is output. Mm -hmm. So as I understand the GPL, uh, the, the, the data set is kind of like it's a source of the, of the model. Mm -hmm. So if you are distributing the, 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 the code to, uh, 
to to uh, to a model that's been uh, GPL, it seems to me you would be required to to distribute the data set too. Yeah, that's the understanding of the uh, BoxForge people. Yes, and uh, yeah, they, they seem to be very confident that the GPL is all they need to to protect the the, the data from uh, from that type of usage. I find that that meta programming introduces very odd questions because there there are questions such as who creates a piece of code if you if you distribute a software that does meta programming and somebody else runs it on their computer and, and and generates code but they're they're doing nothing but running it and you're getting novel code then who the hell does that belong to but no no that that type of thing i think it's it's it's, it's understood the uh I mean, it's the concept of the compiler, the target, the source. It's, it's. Uh, I mean, GCC is, is GPL, for example, and and you can use it to compile any code you want. That, that's not so much the, the the issue, but it's it's more about in this case whether the source code and uh, object code that are the the terms used there really apply to this, where where you have these speech transcripts and then you have uh, an acoustic model as output. My bet would for that would be. Uh, would be GPL B3, I think. It, uh, the, a lot of the changes in language make it a lot easier to apply to things like this. Um, so I wanted to thank you for doing this talk, because I think this is, it's a really interesting challenge for us going forward. I don't have any clear answers, but I wanted to point out um, another uh, analog to this kind of problem, uh, which I think we're going to see more and more, which is, um, which is fonts. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so we already are struggling with this a little bit in the fonts packaging team of if someone has a font that they develop using proprietary font software mm -hmm. and they distribute it as a TTF um, mm -hmm. and we can modify TTFs directly, we have all the information of the font, we, it's entirely modifiable by us but it's not their modifications. Um, so this is, that's one issue but it's not, the, the part that's closer to what you're describing is that there are now um, a handful of auto kerning services mm. that are being run on the net where you take a font and that you haven't actually kerned. That is, you haven't specified the spacing between letters. Um, and these auto kerning services can tune up your font and make it look better automatically through some algorithmic process. Mm -hmm. um, and so you just got this big change in your font in whatever formats you had and now you've got a new font. Like, is that a free font or not? Because you had to pay this proprietary service to do it, and it's not clear what we can redistribute if we don't have the auto kerning functionality in Debian as well. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a bunch of places where these kind of questions come up. And and that, is that being discussed in Debian legal or just discuss it within the fonts packaging? We've discussed on the fonts packaging team. We've discussed more the okay. Does the author modify this themselves with a free tool, or do they use some other uh, preferred form of modification. Mm -hmm. We haven't really gotten into the issue of the auto kerning services. I think that's relatively new. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, other people on the fonts team might have more history than that. Hi, I'm afraid I'm going to be bad. I don't really have a question, but I've got quite a sequence of points to make um, as a different, just, I mean, I agree with what, a lot of what you've said, but as another machine learning person, I'd like to give a slightly different perspective on a few things. Um, first of all, you kind of seem to be throwing together all machine learning models here as being black boxes. Um, uh, yeah, well, I, I, I was really trying to, to no, I didn't want to spend the whole yeah. talk on that. But, but yeah. um, I mean, while I would agree with that, say for neural networks and support vector machines, a lot of models, for example, generative models, you can go in and interpret them, and they do mean something. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a kind of, there, is, there are different sides here. There could be some grayness in the middle, but there are some models where it, it definitely does mean something we've, once you've learned it. Um, a different, and a second thing about the data sets, mm -hmm. you seem to, I would, to, to be provocative, you seem to be a bit stuck in the past in thinking that we have these big, perf perfect data sets that are, of great worth and that we really need to care about and that they are fixed forever. I mean, yes, um, say you mentioned syntactic parsers still using the same data sets that have been around for decades, but that could be because syntactic parsing is kind of irrelevant and gone by now. 
Um, no, no, actually the, the progress of syntactic parse is stuck because they are with that data. Yeah, but I mean, the, all the current translation software say doesn't try to use syntactic parsing. Mm -hmm. It just uses lots of data. Um, and in the world where actually what you just want is a lot of data, clearly in some way the issue, I mean, yes, I agree on, on a, mm -hmm. and it depends on the kind of task. Um, so say if for something like voice recognition, there is a genuine issue because collecting, well, maybe LibreVox say could be a solution, but at the moment collecting good voice data to use costs money and we, or there hasn't been a community initiative to do the same. But a lot of the problems we're actually worried about at the moment, I wouldn't, I don't think this, the, the way you're painting it is quite, um, I don't think it's as black as that, as mm -hmm. bleak, um, because a lot of things we care about at the moment are actually working with internet data, with web data. And um, in many cases, the people working on these wouldn't ever think even of building a fixed data set that they redistribute. So what they tend to have is a script that fetches, say, some collection of web data than they use. And obviously, yes, there is in principle, it would be nice to have, be able to say the data set is free and you transfer it around, but it's not just a question about, well, for one point, it's not just a question about freeness or proprietary, because a lot of the time, no one has permission to redistribute that data. If you fetch a million images from Flickr, or if you fetch all the text pages you can find on the web, no one possibly has permission to do that. And yes, but, you can't but in general, the after, after they do that fetching, they will go for some sessions of mechanical torque or stuff like that to annotate no, stuff. No, not necessarily at all. A lot of methods use completely um, unannotated data. Yeah, well, in, in natural language processing, uh, there's people still annotate stuff if, if you want to get you know, labels and stuff. Yeah, but again, the, the most promising techniques recently have not been... Oh, but that's just a research bias. I'm talking about what the papers I saw three weeks ago in the NLP conference. The people still use plenty of supervised learning. Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, um, I, again, I'm, I'm saying it is a problem for some categories, say for voice recognition, say if you really care about parsing syntax trees so you can draw a nice sentence, structure of your sentence diagrams. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of... You seem to be suggesting that for all machine learning methods here, we would have a problem for this in Debian. No, and no, I, I mean, the, the thing is, you have to see also that engineering tracks research maybe 10, 15 years yeah. or even more. I mean, most people, when you say machine learning, they think of neural networks, but nobody's using neural networks for the last 10, 15 years. But I, I would put the neural networks because I, I wanted to communicate with the yeah. people in the audience. And m maybe one final thing before I shut up. Um, on Daniel's point about the font packages, mm -hmm. I don't believe that's, par that's a precise parallel to transferring around a model that you train, because what you're talking about for the kerning question is a magic service that does something and that you don't really understand. However, there is a machine learning parallel for this, which is that Google have, rec well, I re in the last few years, had some service where you can throw data at them with labels and they will give you back a model that predicts the labels. Mm -hmm. And in this situation, that is pretty scary. You have no idea what method they're doing. I mean, even, even if you didn't care about freeness, in fact, next week they might completely change the method, um, which might improve your results, might make it much worse, and so on. So that is a thing we would need to be alert to to watch, that I think that kind of, if you have the kind of model that came from that kind of service, then in my opinion, that probably just is a, effectively, probably is a non-free model for the reasons that you're picking up. Um, although I think there could be other types of model where it's okay and it is more similar to the kind of is it j distributing a JPEG okay question. So uh, I, I want to push back a little bit on one of the things that you said. You said you were saying it to be provocative, so I'm provoked. Um, so uh, it seems like you're saying it's not that bleak. There's a lot of machine learning techniques that don't rely on these closed proprietary data sets. They just pull random stuff off the web or whatever, right? But uh, our build these don't have network access. And even if they did have network access, we want repeatable builds. So either we don't ship any models at all in that context, and then it's the user's job to build the model from their own network connection later which is particularly unuseful if someone wants just something that will do voice recognition or something that will do analysis of internet text. 
or we have these weird non-repeatable build situations, which is and 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 you can't actually get that same model the next time you build the package, and that's not acceptable from the Debian archive at the moment. And we also want legal builds. These companies can do that because they keep it secret. Yes, uh, if we publicly come and say we are distributing this file that is a derivative from this blog that says cop copyright, blah, 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 and, and there is this log on the Debian build that says, well, we fetched the log of this person, we may get just sue. Um, I have, yeah, I have a few points on this uh, uh, ping pong thingy. Um, uh, one, uh, one of them is that um, with the font and, and these uh, models generated by data and so on, um, there's two trends that, are th that I think are really important. And, and, and one of them is the blurring between the data and code line. And the other one is uh, machine uh, generation, possibly distributed. Uh, I think um, the, 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 the IP model um, is, is very based on humans generating stuff. And, and, and specifically humans generating code, and code being very well separated from data. So as these lines blur, I expect that the IP model will be increasingly strained uh, and, and, and obviously not work in, 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 very, weird, uh, in, in very weird ways. And, uh, the intellectual property? Uh, and, <laughs> And about uh, the the builds, I th I think obviously yes. If you're if you're making a model, you can't expect the, the 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 build machines to to make the model for the build. And what I expect is if we start distributing models like this, and they're being automatically generated for builds, what I would expect is that 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 you would uh, s sort of have a subsidiary uh, system that is in charge just of generating models which are evolving and when you make a build you just uh, ask that subsystem for the model that you want to include yeah just on this question again um you can also i mean ma while i'm saying i don't think it's bleak it's also partly because i think doing anything other than just saying models is okay is utterly unrealistic for some of this because basically if i go off and collect some web data to train a, um, a semi-supervised model say then the data, the, in a modern system, the kind of data size that you would be looking at is kind of minimum terabytes. And I really do not believe that Debian is going to decide as a project we're going to say, insist on distributing around terabytes of data for particular packages. Um, oh, I forgot I had a, a, a comment about meaningfulness. I, I think any model is inherently un understandable. The, the, the question is, is it easy to understand and is it made to be easily understood? Uh, I think we have a, do you have a question? Uh, okay, so from my experience, the worst part about... Uh, Talk closer. Yes, the worst part about machine learning is always to find the correct data set. Now we are talking about not only finding a data set that will do the job for us, we're talking about a data set that also has a suitable license for us. Mm -hmm. So for me, that, that is first a much more difficult problem that, than maybe is understood from your presentation. Second, if you get to do that, I'm sure many, most researchers around the world are going to thank you eternally for that. But to me, that sounds like a really huge problem. But uh, the issues of uh, caring about the license is cornerstone to Debian. And many other users and distributions thank us for that. Yes, so sure, it makes our task more difficult, but that's the task we have set ourselves to do in the realm of software. Of course, I'm not arguing to that. Mm -hmm. like, it would be a very, very good thing. <laughs> but it's, I don't think it's feasible within a reasonable amount of time. That's what, that's what I mean. Well, if we, we, it could take us a long while to get there, but once we get there, we will keep improving. Yes, and um, you, you will keep improving. You will have many, many more people than just the Linux world. Mm -hmm. 
That's okay. Mm -hmm. on, on just on coming back on yeah. on the dis understanding understandability of models, mm -hmm. there is a big difference because, for example, if you if you train a support vet, I mean, I don't know if you had your nice picture of an SVM, because probably no one else in the room remembers what an SVM is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people show you nice pictures like this, and in two dimensions, it's kind of understandable what it's doing. But in fact, when you've got your kind of 10,000 dimensional data or whatever it is, um, you end up, the way an SVM works is it ends up choosing an effectively arbitrary set of data points that define this separation line. And there is no fundamental meaning to those ones. It's just, it's found something that happened to work well with your training data. But if you move one point by a fraction, you get a completely different answer and so on. Whereas some other methods um, are much more understandable in that they're actually giving you statistical properties, for example, of your data that you can actually uh, look you at. And you have a, a, yeah. updatable models. But in, that in, in, in some other types of model, for generative models, for example, mm -hmm. every individual number that your model has would actually have a meaning. And maybe thinking about all those numbers together is difficult, but you can still, it's still impossible, it is possible in principle to dig into it and work out what's going on unlike with, say, an SVM. But do you think you can actually modify it in a meaningful way? I mean, unless there are models that you can update, like a, an updatable name base or stuff like that? If you've, well, it, obviously, it depends what your task is, how complex that is. But yes, I mean, if you have got something like a hidden Markov model, which is heavily used in speech recognition, mm -hmm. then yes, I mean, I, don't, I think knowing what to modify and having a good idea about it would be pretty tricky. But mm -hmm. it would be straightforward if you somehow knew what was a sensible thing to do. It would be very straightforward to modify it. Yeah, that, that's what the speech recognition uh, final user adaptation does, in a sense. So, yeah. But I mean, again, just to on this point as well, um, when I'm making the distinction between the models, I think this is, this is a genuine thing, the thing we should think about. And maybe mm -hmm. when we choose models in Debian for or for free software projects, we should try to choose ones which are interpretable, mm -hmm. because, for example, often. Um, People love SVMs because they're a black box that they could, there's lots of C libraries you can throw things in and you get an answer out with good results. Um, but there's another model, I mean, other models say um, um, logistic regression often gives almost as good results and basically the same result, but gives a model that you can interpret. So if you're trying to get, publish a research paper that gets 1% better than last year's paper and gets you into the conference, then obviously you care about that tiny detail. But if what we really care about is free software and um, mm -hmm. the, that kind of thing, then maybe we should also be preferring the models which, making an active decision to prefer models which are interpretable and therefore avoid this problem. Uh, I th you have something? Okay. Very you quick. have machine learning about machine learning soon. Ah, recursion. Why would I need to understand the, the model itself? Yeah, I mean, it's like a, the, the source code of a program, OK, you understand it. But the binary, you don't need to understand it. For me, the, the model is quite often, yes, you, you won't need to understand the model because you, you just know it works. You see it, the results. I, I don't see what the uh, need to understand it is uh, connected to the point of being free. And in that uh, note, we can continue the discussion uh, uh, on the mailing list or offline. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for not flaming.